Hi, my name is Melissa Canfield, and this is part of my CI 350 class um, unit plan. My unit plan is all about the Civil War and West Virginia's impact in that. And today I'm going to be talking about John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. But before I can talk about the raid, I need to talk about John Brown and his life before the raid. So John Brown was born in 1800. He grew up believing that slavery was a moral sin against God, and his father was a very religious man. He, John Brown would go to church every day, and he knew that slavery was wrong. So during the War of 1812, John Brown was on a cattle drive, which is moving large herds of cattle from one location to the other. And there was only one other 12-year-old on this cattle drive, and he happened to be a little African-American boy. And so 12-year-olds, they make friends very quickly. And so John Brown became really close friends with this African-American. And so we're not, historians aren't really too sure of how it actually happened, but the African-American um, little boy, he did something menial. We're not sure what it was. But it could have been simply knocking over a glass of water or breaking a glass. We're, we're, not, we're not too sure. But he was beaten to an inch of his life in front of John Brown. And when John Brown saw this, a 12-year-old boy decided that he was going to end slavery. He was going to devote the rest of his life to ending slavery and its moral sin. So... John Brown, just 12 years old, decided, I'm going to end slavery regardless of how I do it. It's going to happen within my life. So as John Brown got a little bit older, um, in the early 1850s, um, when Kansas was becoming a state, um, there was lots of pro-slavery and anti-slavery people in Kansas who were trying to make their state either for slavery or against slavery. And something called popular sovereignty, which means that the people get to vote, um, was happening in Kansas. So all of the pro-slavery people were trying to get more people into Kansas that were pro-slavery, and all the anti-slavery people were trying to get more people that were anti-slavery into Kansas. So that there would be more votes for whatever they wanted. Well... Some of John Brown's sons were out in Kansas at this point, and he and they were like, they called up their dad and they were like, Dad, you need to get out to Kansas because there's so many people out here who are for slavery that we're afraid that Kansas is going to become a slave state. So John Brown went out there, and if you've ever heard of Bleeding Kansas, you've probably heard of John Brown. He became known as Osawatomie Brown for the murders that he did along the Osawatomie Creek out in Kansas. Um, one family in particular, the Doyles, um, John Brown went into their home. The Doyles were not slave owners. They owned no slaves, yet they were pro-slavery, which means that they wanted slaves out in Kansas. He went into their home and he killed the father and the two oldest sons. He spared the life of the youngest son because the mother was sick and she needed her youngest son there to take care of him, take care of her. Also, John Brown, while out in Kansas, he killed two other men, which gave him the name Osawatomie Brown. After Kansas, Brown was a wanted man. He just killed five people. He was involved in Bleeding Kansas. People wanted John Brown's body. They wanted him dead. So if you're a wanted man, you're going to need to do a couple things. But before what John Brown did, this is what John Brown looked like at the time of Bleeding Kansas. Kind of like a creepy guy. <laughs> All right. So John Brown, he, after Kansas... He still has this passion in his heart that he wants to end slavery. But at this point, everyone knows the name John Brown. Everyone knows what he did out in Kansas. So he had to disguise himself in a little way. 
So John Brown decided that he was going to raid Harper's Ferry. And before I tell you how he did it and what he did, I'm going to tell you how he disguised himself. So he changed his name. He needed an alias. So he called himself Isaac Smith. And he had to change his appearance a little bit, too. So he decided to grow a really long beard. So if you remember the picture I just showed you of John Brown in Kansas, here's John Brown in Harper's Ferry. He grew a long beard, a long white beard, and people didn't really recognize him. And he changed his name, so people didn't know that he, Isaac Smith, was John Brown. So why... Is, why does John Brown want to raid Harper's Ferry so badly? What does Harper's Ferry have that he wants? So let's look at this map of Harper's Ferry. Well, it's of the area around Harper's Ferry in 1859. So I highlighted our Harper's Ferry in orange. So if you could see where that is. Then over here, you can see in purple, there's Washington, D.C. And above it is Baltimore, Maryland. The, t the yellow highlighted line is the Potomac River, and the green highlighted line is the Shenandoah River. Harper's Ferry is where the two rivers meet, and that allows for transportation of materials into Harper's Ferry and out of Harper's Ferry. So while John Brown was um, had his alias of Isaac Smith, he was living at the Kennedy Farmhouse, which I've highlighted in blue right there. So he rented a house at the Kennedy Farm, and he you could see how close it is in proximity to Harper's Ferry itself. So while living at the Kennedy Farmhouse, John Brown really got to know the ins and outs of the town of Harper's Ferry. And there's something at Harper's Ferry that he wants. Harper's Ferry at this time housed a United States armory and arsenal, which is where they make and store the weapons for the United States Army. And it was also located in Virginia. And Virginia at this time was the largest slaveholding state in the Union. It had about four million slaves. So that makes John Brown want to go there even more. So John Brown, he still has this plan in his heart that he wants to end slavery. So he has this idea. He says, if I can acquire an army, and if I can acquire some weapons, I can free all of the slaves in the United States of America. So he, he has his mind made up. This is what I'm going to do. So he goes to Harper's Ferry. He's staying at the Kennedy Farmhouse. And he's compiling weapons, and he's compiling um, an army. So he would comp his weapons consisted of guns, and they also consisted of pikes. And I, I'm not very much of an artist, but I drew a picture of what a pike looks like, kind of. Yeah. It's a long um, wooden stick with, like, a spear at the tip of it. So why would he need to have pikes and guns? Could, wouldn't you think guns would just be enough? Well, in his army that he was compiling, he thought that he was going to have African-American slaves and um, free African-Americans, and they're not going to know how to operate a gun. So he needed something that he could just hand them and they could just protect themselves with. So he acquired these spears and, and guns. So he compiles his army. Harper's Ferry at the time kind of looked a little bit like this map here. Along the hmm, Potomac River, you see all of the orangish buildings up all in a row. That is the United States Armory Grounds. It was about six football fields long, so it was a lot of buildings and space there. Get you to look at the map really close. So John Brown had a lot of buildings that he needed to 
Um, if he was going to raid this town and compile even more weapons and more ammunition to free all of the slaves in the United States, Harper's Ferry was the place to do it. Harper's Ferry at this time had a population of approximately 3,000 people. 3,000 people. How many, sla how many people in his little army do you think he's going to need to raid a town of 3,000? It's 1859, Harper's Ferry, 3,000 people. Is he going to need 1,000 people in his army? Is he going to need 100,000 people? Is he going to need 500 people? How many is he going to need? Well, John Brown compiles an army of 21 men. They call themselves the Provisional Army of the United States. And John Brown expected to get a lot more than 21 men. He expected slaves to rise up in the middle of his raid and join him right out of Harper's Ferry. But they didn't. He had 21 people. So, now that you know a little bit about John Brown before the raid, I'm going to tell you about the raid. So on October 16th, 1859, John Brown's journey brought him and his 21 followers to Virginia. As John Brown and his, and his men, known as the Provisional Army of the United States, marched, over the Potomac River Bridge into the silent town of Harper's Ferry. For many weeks before the raid, Brown and his men had hidden away on the nearby Kennedy Farmhouse in Maryland. Just before the raid, John Brown's men with weapons hidden under their long overcoats captured the bridge watchman and cut the telegraph wires. When they reached the armory, the scared but determined watchman refused them entrance, so they snapped the chain and entered the armory through the iron gate. The fight to free the enslaved people had begun. John Brown's band was an assortment of men from different backgrounds. One raider, a 40-year-old Dangerfield newbie, a former slave and blacksmith, joined Brown when he could not buy freedom for his wife and children. Dangerfield, Dangerfield's wife sent him letters, begging him to help her. One letter read, Buy me and the baby as soon as possible, for if you do not get me, somebody else will. Brown's men quickly seized the railroad tracks and armory and arsenal. They began to take hostages. One townsperson, Daniel Young, an armory worker, told Brown's men, I warn you that before this day is done, they, this day's done shall have set, you and your companions will be corpses. So Harper's Ferry wasn't thinking that um, Brown was going to succeed in his battle. At 1.25 a.m., the mail and passenger train came into town and was stopped. Hayward Shepard, a free black man and the B&O Railroad baggage master, went up the tracks to investigate. When the raiders ordered Shepard to halt, he turned and ran back, and a shot rang out. Ironically, the first person killed during John Brown's raid was not a slaveholder, or even a slave, but a free African-American shot in the back. Soon, a militia of local citizen soldiers arrived from Virginia and Maryland and began to close in on the raiders. Gunshots filled the air. Militia and raiders exchanged fire, and around 7 a.m., Dangerfield Newby was one of the first raiders to die. His body was later thrown to the hogs. A short time later, Brown allowed the train to leave. At the next stop, the conductor immediately sent out word of the raid over the telegraph. President James Buchanan, in response to the alarming news, ordered 90 United States Marines under the, under the command of Lieutenant Israel Green to Harper's Ferry. Later that day, Mayor Fontaine Beckham was killed. Outraged by the death of their popular mayor, townspeople dragged out a captured raider and executed him on the bridge.
<laughs> By the evening, the remaining raiders and, host and a handful of hostages were cornered in the armory's fire engine house. This is what the uh, fire engine house looks like. Later th that night, the mar Marines under Lieutenant Green from Washington City arrived by train. Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee arrived soon, accompanied by Lieutenant Jeb Stewart, and they took command and entered the armory yard and replaced the disorganized militia. Jeb Stewart approached the door in the presence of perhaps 2,000 spectators and told Brown that, if, that he had a communication for him from Colonel Robert E. Lee. Brown cracked open the door. Robert... Um, Robert E. Lee's communication said that if you will peaceably surrender, you shall be kept in safety to await the orders of the president. Brown refused, and Stewart waved his hat, signaling the Marines to move in. Several Marines crashed a ladder against the engine house door and made a small hole. Lieutenant Green led the charge inside. As Marines entered, the raiders fired. In about three minutes, the fighting was over. Brown, though injured, was taken alive. Nineteen raiders had entered Harper's Ferry. Ten were killed, five were captured, and four escaped. Four townspeople and one Marine were also killed. Local enslaved men also died in connection with the event. All hostages came out alive. The next day, Brown and the other raiders were taken by train to nearby Charlestown. Brown's trial lasted for five days. On the final day, the clerk of the court asked the jury for the verdict. The foreman of the jury stood up and gave their answer, guilty. The clerk of the court pronounced guilty of treason and conspiring and advising with slaves and others to rebel and murder in the first degree. Brown was sentenced to death. He spent the final eve of his life with his wife, Mary, she begged Virginia Governor Wise that she be allowed to take back with her the mortal remains of her husband and his sons. Brown's hope for freedom of the enslaved ended when he was hung on December 2, 1859. In his last message, John Brown wrote, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. So now that you've heard the John Brown story, um, be John Brown before the raid, the raid, and what happened to John Brown after the raid, maybe your interpretation of West Virginian life during the Civil War may be a little bit different. And maybe you'll see that the United States before the Civil War was not a very good place there was people enslaved all over the southern states of the U.S. And John Brown was just one abolitionist of many who wanted to stop the evil institution of slavery. So I thank you for watching this and listening. And I hope that you learned something about Harper's Ferry history and about John Brown. Thank you.